Today, an attorney specializing in religious freedom issues gives his perspective about new laws curtailing free speech and the free practice of religion. That next on Significant Insights. Hello and welcome to the program. Good to have you with us today. Noel Sterrett, partner with the law firm Mock & Baker, is my guest. Mock & Baker is nationally known for representing churches, individuals, and religious institutions on a variety of religious liberty issues. Noel has litigated at both the trial and appellate levels in courts across the country, from Idaho to New Jersey, advocating for the civil liberties of churches and ministries. He also serves on the board of Courtside Ministries, a prayer ministry for people on the way in and out of court. We begin our conversation with a fallout for Christian business owners of the Supreme Court's decision to legalize gay marriage. Noel, thanks for being with me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, let's talk about uh, one, uh, a couple of incidents that uh, I feel are incredibly problematic and that in my own mind I have difficulty dealing with. And that is uh, a bakery. A couple who own a bakery, these have happened in more than one occasion. Sure. A uh, same-sex couple comes in and they want a cake. In some cases they come there because they have a good idea that, of how they will respond. And the couple says, you know, we really don't bake a cake for same-sex marriage because of our beliefs and so forth. Right. So they sue them and the bakery ends up having to close uh, because of that. So the question then is what is the right of that company mm -hmm. uh, to be able to say, uh, especially when there's probably a hundred bakeries in that community, that uh, we, we would prefer you go to another bakery and having the right to do that or being forced to make that cake the case has been made, well, but they don't have the right to discriminate. Uh, however, a, uh, a clothes designer says, I will not make a dress for uh, the uh, new first lady because I don't agree with her position. And I've seen no outrage, no problem from the mainline press. So is it really, it, it, does this go back to the First Amendment issue that it's very selective? Or how do we, how do we deal with that? Yeah, and I think in the context of the, the baker, the florist, the videographer, uh, you have to look at it not perhaps um, in terms of the free exercise of religion, though I completely think that that right is, is important and protects the florist, the baker, the uh, videographer. I think primarily in these cases what we're watching is an erosion of the freedom of speech, much like the people that are supporting the designer, when they, you know, the, whoever the designer is that doesn't want to provide clothes to uh, the new first lady, uh, he doesn't want to communicate with, by providing clothes to her that he supports the candidacy or the pre new president. That's a freedom of speech, much like the videographer or the florist, for example, in Washington. She served this gay couple for years. She was friends with this gay couple. Well, she, went, she didn't have any objection to providing flowers to them. What she did is she said, I have flowers that I don't want to lend my artistic voice yeah. to celebrating something that I believe that God forbids. So it really is more, in my opinion, something that's eroding our freedom of speech. And I think what we're seeing is that the zeitgeist spirit of America is now, culturally speaking, in support of uh, homosexual um, discrimination claims, so where the sexual ethic trumps the religious rights. And we're seeing that throughout the Human Rights Commissions the, at both the federal and state level. Well, and let's then, go back to my first statement. Yeah. Uh, we uh, really were promised that none of these issues would enter the church, and yet uh, through Hobby Lobby, uh, not in the church, but through Christians with strong beliefs, through Hobby Lobby with the Obamacare uh, mandate, uh, but also uh, through 
this type of thing. And now are you beginning to hear of pressure on pastors in terms of transgender and also on same-sex marriage that you cannot discriminate uh, in who you perform weddings for or who is using your building? Yes, even Justice Alito, I think, mentioned this in the Obergefell case, the same-sex marriage case that the Supreme Court decided. Uh, Justice Scalia also uh, referenced it. Well, what's to keep the state? from telling those who license and approve marriages, which are pastors, priests, etc., that in order to have this authority to approve marriages for the state, you must adopt and abide by the state's definition. The new definition that the Now, Supreme is this Court hypothetical you're talking about? These are hypotheticals this, that were actually raised during actually, oral argument. actually happening? Well, what's actually happening is even uh, scarier in some sense. Uh, in Iowa, for instance, the uh, Iowa Human Rights Commission decided that they were going to treat church buildings as a place of public accommodation. So in other words, when you have a church and it's open to the public, you are now subject to public accommodation laws. They actually put out a pamphlet that identified this question, are churches a place of public accommodation? Well, this Iowa uh, agency said yes. So if you would rent your church out for a wedding? Or even have your service open on Sundays. Even have what? Your service open to the public on Sundays, which every pastor that I know of would. And so the upshot of that was they were trying to make the statement to the Iowa churches that that means you must make sure your facility is friendly to those uh, struggling with sexual orientation or gender dysphoria, the transgender issue, and you must make sure that uh, nothing is uh, basically hostile to those who are uh, dealing with this issue. So if you're a pastor and you know your place is being considered a place of public accommodation, you better watch what you say from the pulpit. You better watch what you put on your bulletin boards. And you better make sure your bathrooms are compliant. Now, that was fought uh, by the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a group that we work closely with. And uh, they have, um, you know, Iowa redoing their pamphlet and saying, well, wait, we're not going to push the public accommodation laws that far, even though they did. Churches aren't the only ones that need protection. Illinois Governor Bruce Rauner has recently signed into law a bill forcing crisis pregnancy centers to refer their clients to abortion clinics. We'll talk about that after the break. Taking a pro-life crisis pregnancy center and turning it into a referral source for Planned Parenthood? Yes, we're fighting this. We have two cases currently pending. We're hopeful that the courts will join the enforcement of this law. It's a violation of the free exercise of religion. It's a violation of their freedom of speech. They shouldn't be forced to carry the government's message of these so-called benefits of abortion. And ultimately what we need to do is understand that the light hates, the darkness hates the light. And when you are standing there proclaiming that this is a life, uh, darkness where it says, no, you should be able to kill this child, uh, will want to silence you and will want to say, well, if you can't uh, participate in abortions, you need to refer your people to us. And so we're gonna fight it. Welcome back. Today, I'm talking with attorney Newell Sterrett of Mock and Baker. In part one, we discuss free speech issues and how legalizing gay marriage has adversely affected Christian business owners' First Amendment rights. As we continue, we talk about laws that affect pastors' rights to counsel and laws affecting crisis pregnancy centers. Governor Reiner uh, of Illinois has basically uh, signed into the law the, what's called the Youth Mental Health Protection Act, California has already uh, acted on that law, basically saying that you cannot counsel a, a person uh, if they're homosexual, that even if they want counseling, that you're not able to counsel them uh, because that's a mental health issue. Uh, how do you see that? What do you see happening with that? Well, I think back to the definitions. Uh, we in Illinois have had uh, the ability as pastors, priests, to provide counseling to those who are in our congregation. Uh, a young man comes up to you as a pastor and says, I've been really struggling uh, with same-sex attraction. 
I understand that God defines human sexuality to be something that should be enjoyed in the context of marriage, uh, and that homosexual attraction is, not, is a disorder. It's not a, according to God's good order. Uh, it's something that I want to overcome. Pastor, can you lead me through the scripture? Can you pray with me? Can you talk to me about God's ordering of sexuality? Well, what we're seeing on the psychiatrist, um, psychologist front is that more and more, and it's very political, uh, they're staffing the committees with people that are viewing this this way. They're saying, you, pastor, um, or psych they started with the psychiatrists and the counselors. They said, you psychiatrists and counselors, if you're going to get a license from the state, you cannot represent to people that this is a disorder. So what they're severing, and a lot of the Christian counselors, a lot of the Christian psychiatrists are faced with this in California, New Jersey, and in Illinois. What do we do? Because typically when you counsel somebody, you don't just provide the medical component. It's holistic. You, you talk about the moral issues, you talk about the uh, societal issues, and, and you, you address the whole person. Uh, unfortunately, Illinois went to take it a step further, and even though uh, we wanted an exemption passed in the General Assembly that said that this does not apply to pastors. They refused to put that exemption in. So we were forced to file a lawsuit saying, no, we've got a group of pastors that seek to protect the youth, allow the youth to come to them. They're not trying to convert anybody against their will. They just want the freedom that inherent in the First Amendment that God's given them to counsel people in their congregation. So that's the current lawsuit that's the that current has, lawsuit. has been filed. Yes. Because at this point, the law as it would be passed or as it has been passed would not allow a pastor to say anything about that person's sexual identity. Yes, essentially what the law is is any person in commerce. So a lot of pastors, as you know, provide their counseling sure. for a fee on the side. So anybody in commerce is prohibited from representing homosexual attraction as a disorder. So we have pastors that uh, provide counseling, that that's Part of the reason why they get paid um, their salary is to provide counseling, and they do so not only to members of their congregation, but people in the community. A, a few years ago, in one of the communities close to here, a community I lived in at the time, uh, there was a Hindu temple. And the school uh, basically said that this is a wonderful opportunity to uh, show the diversity of our community and so forth, which, you know, is not a bad idea. The diversity of our community and so we're going to conduct tours of the Hindu temple and have speakers that talk about the, the religion and so forth. Uh, however, uh, that could not be done from a Christian perspective. Right. Today we're seeing, I, I just was reading something the other day that in a, in a school, I think it was in Wisconsin if I'm correct, that they're having a diversity day and all of the teachers are supposed to wear uh, the hijab, the, the, the scarves. Uh, and yet, that would be considered a separation of church and state if something on, on a Christian order, a nativity scene, for example, right. was placed. Uh, how do we get by with that? How, how, does that? how are we suggesting that one is not the other? Well, I think it's rank hypocrisy. I think that's uh, fairly apparent. Uh, unfortunately, what we've seen is we've seen a perversion of the Establishment Clause, uh, the understanding of what is the separation of church and state, and as you pointed out, it's almost always used to exclude any um, interaction with the Christian faith. Oh, they're reading a Bible in school. Oh, they're praying. Oh, we're having a graduation as uh, assembly in the local church because they had the largest auditorium. That happened in Brookfield, Wisconsin. But you can have a prayer place for a Muslim right. at the university. Yes. But you couldn't do that. Before. No, you should, under the Constitution, and as I read it, and historically yeah. speaking, when you look at the original text, you should be able to do both. Religion should not be treated as some type of toxin uh, that American children and people, American citizens, are, are kept from. It should be something that we should learn about. Uh, we should be able to read the Bible because it's one of the greatest pieces of literature known to man. In other words, if you want to teach a child to read and write, the Bible is one of the best tools. Uh, we should be able to interact with religion, a, a diversity of religions, in such a way as it's not toxin, a toxin. Uh, unfortunately, what the courts have done is basically said, no, religion is a toxin, particularly when it comes to the uh, historically powerful religion of the Christian 
faith in America. And so that's where you look at the, these cases that develop and they say, oh, well, we can't have some 18-year-old high school students or graduating high school sit in these pews and see the announcements on the church bulletin board because they, they might be converted, you know, God forbid. And I, I just think uh, we, we see this uh, hypocrisy. Are, are, these are things that uh, uh, with the kind of law that you're involved in today with the church that I'm sure you're confronting on a fairly regular basis? Yeah, I mean, and what we're seeing it is more at the local level. Uh, we're seeing municipalities uh, start to uh, find ways of keeping re new religious ministries out, um, primarily due to money, uh, because they don't want a new not-for-profit ministry to the homeless, a new church coming in. It means a loss of tax revenue. Yeah. And so they're acting as gatekeepers using their zoning code and building code to shut these places down, to keep them out. And uh, what I'm trying to see and happen is we need to get back to a place where the value of religious exercise is seen by the community. And I think that's being lost. No, one of the things that uh, uh, is, is in the courts currently um, is the fact that, pro, uh, that uh, pregnancy counseling centers are being forced to refer women to abortion clinics, and that's being challenged. Yeah, uh, what's we, happening with we that? We have uh, a number of crisis pregnancy centers in Illinois uh, that are challenging an amendment that the Illinois General Assembly just passed. Governor Rauner put, signed into law. He said he wasn't going to take any stance on social issues, so he just signed it into law and didn't uh, exempt crisis pregnancy centers. But what the effect of the amendment was is it says, okay, crisis pregnancy centers, if you don't want to do abortions or participate in it, if a woman comes to you and she wants an abortion, you can't just remove yourself from the process. You have to give her a list of abortion clinics where she can have the abortion. You have to have protocol in place to discuss the benefits of abortion. Well, this is anathema to pro-life medical professionals. Pro-life crisis pregnancy centers, the very reason why they exist is to uh, help women see that there are no benefits to abortion. There's a loss of life, there's danger to you, but yet uh, the state decided uh, to take the Illinois Health Care Right of Conscience Act, which was the gold standard across the country to protecting the right of conscience, and they decided to basically invert the purpose of it and says, well, if you're going to exert your right of conscience, you better refer to abortion clinics taking a pro-life crisis pregnancy center and turning it into a referral source for Planned Parenthood. Yes, we're fighting this. We have two cases currently pending. We're hopeful that the courts will enjoin the enforcement of this law. It's a violation of their free exercise of religion. It's a violation of their freedom of speech. They shouldn't be forced to carry the government's message of the so-called benefits of abortion. And ultimately what we need to do is understand that the light hates, the, the darkness hates the light. And when you are standing there proclaiming that this is a life. Uh, darkness, where it says, no, you should be able to kill this child, uh, will want to silence you and will want to say, well, if you can't uh, participate in abortions, you need to refer your people to us. And so we're going to fight it. But uh, if I'm correct, there is not a reciprocal arrangement that if a woman goes to Planned Parenthood, that she would have to be referred to a pro-life center to at least give a perspective on not having that abortion. No, there's not. And in fact, I've got another case in North Carolina where a crisis pregnancy center bought the property right next to the abortion clinic. The city said, fine, the abortion clinic could go forward, but you, crisis pregnancy center, can't. And so what we're watching is, again, it's this hypocrisy. Uh, we can have this and this approval, but if you're a place of light and life, ordering your operations in accordance with scripture, well, you're going to find a, an uphill battle, but that's why attorneys like Malkin Baker are here to help with the up, uh, uphill battles. Glad you're there. Malkin Baker is on the front lines fighting battles trying to preserve the rights of churches, religious institutions, and individuals. In Chicago, you can hear Noel on WYLL Sundays at 3 p.m. on the radio program Lawyers for Jesus. Noel also practices in the area of adoption law. If you'd like to contact him, you can reach him at nsterrett at mockbaker.com. Final thoughts on serving your community right after this. She did good, especially to the household of faith. That she also did so, so much good in that community that they didn't want her to leave. What does that say about you and me?
You know, there's no question that lawyers like Noel Sterrett and all those at Mock and Baker are serving their community and the body of Christ. They're fighting every day for believers who are losing their voices and their freedoms in our country. What's the responsibility of the rest of us when it comes to serving the community? Felicia Thompson, Executive Director of the Roosevelt Road Project at Christ Community Church of Oak Brook, poses that question in today's Final Thoughts. Lately, I was struck with the reality of reality television. I think it's something that's coming back to haunt us as Christians and as those who don't know Christ. I've been reading lately in the scripture, and particularly in Galatians chapter 6 at verse 10, where it says, therefore, we should not lose heart, but therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And I began to think, what does that mean? What does it mean to do good to everyone, even those who are the household of faith? And then I was driven to scripture in Acts chapter nine, and it talks about a woman of God who was so known for doing good that she was raised from the dead. It says in Acts chapter nine, verse 36, that at Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which in translation means Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in the upper room. And since Lida was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while they were with him, while she was with them. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And the end of the story is that she was raised again. But that's not necessarily the crux of what I wanted to share, but more importantly, who Dorcas was. That she did good, especially to the household of faith. That she also did so, so much good in that community that they didn't want her to leave. What does that say about you and me? Do we do good? Do we have opportunity to share and do good, especially to God's people? Think about that. How is God using you in the world? Will you be remembered for your good works? Thanks, Felicia, for the good word. We appreciate it. Uh, you know, there's three things that I try to live by. Honor God, work very hard, and the third, keep showing up. Well, that's the thing. In fact, all three of those is what I see Mock and Baker doing. I've known John Mock for a long time, and I have a deep appreciation and admiration for what he's doing and the commitment that he has made to defend the freedoms, the constitutional freedoms of the church. And believe me, they work very, very hard in doing this and they keep showing up. And you know, I think that goes for all of us. One of the things that I think is most important, especially in this time that we're living right now where there are so many attacks on our freedom, so many pressures on our spiritual faith, on our First Amendment rights as Christians, and that is that we don't succumb to all of the pressure, but we keep showing up. And not only do we keep showing up, we keep standing for biblical truth. It is absolutely vital for the church to stand for biblical truth, regardless of what's going on in the culture. We must, our obligation, the commandment, is to stand for biblical truth. God bless you, thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time on Significant Insights. Mm -hmm.